you want to predict the future, go ahead and create it. If we can imagine it, we can achieve it. Technology is growing in an exponential way and our brain thinks linearly. And that gap is why a lot of the people end up failing. Science and religion are starting to say the same things in different words. We are all part of that one big floating energy. Every possibility exists until we observe it and then the waves collapse and what we see becomes real. Are we creating the reality? And does the reality exist without the human species watching it? Everything in the world can actually be connected when you think in an abstract terms. I have no experience in this industry and that is my biggest asset. Success is really about how many lives you're able to improve while you're still alive. The day you become humble is the day you become successful. Every time I start a company, I ask myself three basic questions. When you're working on something so audacious that when actually successful, it will change the trajectory of how humanity is going to live. Those ideas are so much easier to do than a small idea. And the reason for that is the experts, the people who are absolutely the top of their game, people who are best in their field, what do they want to do? They want to work on the toughest problems. They want to create a legacy. They want from success, they want to become significant. And what really means is the best and the brightest are more likely to join you and help you actually pursue your mission when you're doing something audacious than actually doing something small. So for example, if you say, I'm gonna build an iPhone app to find a roommate. Now, nobody's going to complain and say you're doing it. They're going to say, great, good luck, have fun with it, right? But when you tell someone, I'm going to change the way healthcare is delivered. I'm going to make illness optional. I'm going to understand what causes people to be sick and find a way to prevent it and reverse it. That is the kind of problem you're likely to get the best people, whether it's the best AI people, every single person that you need, they want to join you on that mission. Not only that, once you have an unbelievably great team that is wants to be helping you with the cause that you have come up with, all the people with the money want to invest in a company now because not only you have a mission when successful can create a massive company, you also have a team that is most likely to succeed. So that means all the money that you need is actually now going to come to you. So basically the resources that you need to be successful now start to align themselves. Right? And one of the interesting thing about audacious ideas are the biggest moonshots, the biggest audacious ideas tend to be these social ideas. That means something that will help millions, hundreds of millions and billions of people live a better life. And anytime you can create any product, any service that helps a billion people live a better life, you can create a hundred billion dollar company. But you don't wake up in the morning and say, what should I do to create a hundred billion dollar company? Making money is simply a byproduct of doing things that help people live a better life, right? That means you never focus on making money, you focus on helping people live a better life. So every day when you wake up, you don't ask yourself, what can I do to create a $100 billion company? You ask yourself, what can I do to improve someone's life? And if you keep doing it, you will create an amazingly great company while you're doing a tremendous good for the humanity. Yeah, that concept of touching a billion people rather than trying to touch a billion dollars <laughs> is really is really. Um, I think when I when I when I drop into your philosophy and your awareness around how you approach life becomes really poignant, and it, it goes it goes deeper to to some level because I found you saying that if you want to really have a big idea and if say if you want to make a billion dollars try and impact 10 billion people, you know, like the scope of it, like think larger. How do you push the envelope on your own thinking? How, how, because I'm sure people come to you with quite limited in the box sort of paradigms um, based on, you know, their upbringing and yet your upbringing <laughs> wasn't the most obvious that you were going to end up where you have ended up, <laughs> if I can put it that way, but yet you've taken the lid off and completely destroyed the box. Can you describe the out of the box 
So there is a framework. I mean, it's, so it's not, not a, nothing that I'm telling you is magical way of thinking. And I will give you the complete, uh, what I would say, rules and the unconventional way of thinking of how to do that. So let's assume you say, I want to uh, do X and that X may be something that's maybe small. And the way to look forward is to say, assume I am absolutely successful in solving that problem, whatever it is that you're doing, what would the world look like and what problems will need to be solved once that problem is solved, right? And then you say, oh, in that case, I would now expand and solve this problem. And then you say, well, now assume that problem is solved. What would the world need that you would want to solve? And that is now, if you go two or three steps further and you say, that is my moonshot. And the way I'm going to get there is starting from here. And I'm going to do this and then this. And this is how I'm going to solve this massive moonshot problem, right? So idea is really is, it doesn't matter where you start. Doesn't mean on day one, you're going to be going out and boiling the ocean but you need to set out your North Star. You want to set out the vision when you are successful, what the world will look like. And then you say, this is what you're going to start with, right? And I'll give you an example of how I apply that thinking to every single company that I start, because that is really the way to ground yourself in terms of how to do that, right? So every time I start a company, I ask myself three basic questions. Why this? Why now? Why me? Why this is, I think we talked briefly about. So why this is every time you ask yourself, is this really something worth doing? So ask yourself that if you are successful in solving the problem that you set out to do, would it help a billion people live a better life, right? Because that is how you know there is a big enough market. There is a massive problem that you're solving. And if you are able to solve this problem, you can create a massive enterprise, right? So first thing is you need to know that exactly that if you're going to dedicate 10, 20 years of your life to solving a problem, is this problem worth solving? And that means, is it going to really help a large amount of people, large number of people live a better life? The second thing is why now? Why now is what had changed in the last couple of years but more importantly, what do you expect to change in the next three to five years that will allow you to solve this problem at scale in the next three to five years? And this problem could not have been solved five years ago. That means you're really looking at this stuff and saying, am I using the tomorrow's technology to solve tomorrow's problem? Or am I using yesterday's technology to solve tomorrow's problem? Right? That means you look at stuff and say, hey, Today, the price performance may not be there, but if I actually start working on it today and by the time I'm ready to actually scale in the next three years, the price performance would have come down enough for me to be able to scale it massively to help a billion people. And I'll apply that to actually the, the, the company that I started and how I went through by doing that. Right? The second part of this problem of why now is actually understanding that to solve this massive audacious problem that you set out to solve, you don't focus on how you're going to do that. You focus on what are the set of problems that need to be solved that will help you achieve this grand mission that you set out, right? So, you, so for example, if you say, I want to live on Venus, you don't say, oh, that is not going to happen or I don't know how to do that. You simply ask yourself, what are the problems that have to be solved for us to live on Venus? And you simply say, okay, I have to be able to leave Earth gravity to go, you know, to leave the Earth gravity, get to the Earth orbit, go all the way from Earth orbit to the Venus orbit, land on Venus and find a way to live on Venus. There are only four problems that need to be solved. Right. And then we say, now we start to say, what is the stuff that's already solved? What is it that incremental that needs to be solved? And what is one big problem that I need to focus on solving because other problems are we're going to be incrementally already get better, right? So that is really about why now. And the biggest thing that you have to really do is why me? And why me is what questions are you asking that are different from what everyone else in the industry is asking. Because the questions you ask is the problem you solve. 
right? That means you and understanding the questions you're asking actually changes the problem you're going to be solving. So if you say, hey, I want to solve a world hunger problem. Every single expert will tell you that means you have to learn to grow the food to increase the yield of the crop. You have to reduce the wastage that you have in terms of transportation. You have to learn how to grow the food closer to where the people, where the demand is. And it's all about how to get more food in the hands of more people. But nobody will ask the question that says, why do we eat food? Because when you ask the question, why we eat food, you suddenly realize the only reason to eat food is you need energy and you need nutrition. What are the different ways can you get energy? Plants get energy using photosynthesis, using the essentially a light and convert the light using chloroplast into energy. Now, can we humans actually use that mechanism? And then we realize there are bacteria who actually not only survive, but thrive in radioactive nuclear waste. And what does it mean? That means these bacteria have figured out how to protect their DNA from the radiation and use radiation as a source of energy. Now, if you can take their genetic material, incorporate that into human genetics using CRISPR, now suddenly, not only we are radiation resistant, we can also use radiation as a source of energy. So honey, do you want to go out and get some radiation? Rather than honey, do you want to go out and get some pizza? And you completely redefine the problem, right? And what that means is by simply asking the question, why we eat food, we have the solutions available to us that would never even be th thought about until you ask that question, right? That of how to, how to solve world hunger problem, right? And the second part of why me is just as important is asking the right question is it, why it matters to me. Why am I willing to dedicate the next decade of my life? And the way I have figured out is, if you're not jumping out of the bed when you wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning, when you're not jumping out of the bed for doing the things you want to do, then whatever you're doing is not your calling. You should quit that and do something else. And this is, I mean, to me, the fact this is 5 a.m. your time and you jumped out of the bed to get this thing set up, it tells you, you want to saw, do this, what you're doing. Because mm. anyone who's doing it as a job would never do that. Anyone who does not believe that what they're doing is worth doing and it's meaningful to other people, they would never get up at 5 a.m. and jump out of the bed. Right? So to me, find something that you're willing to die for and then live for it. Find something that you would do if you had everything in life, you had billions of dollars, you have a loving family, what would you do? And if you do that today, you will get everything that you want. That means going back again, making money is a product of doing things that you enjoy doing that help other people live a better life. Hey there guys, hopefully you're loving this conversation. I'd just love to take a quick moment of your time to ask for a special favor and request, please hit subscribe to the channel. The entire channel you're witnessing, you're participating in, you're a part of here is powered and powered by your subscription. It's you that powers this channel along. Please take a moment to hit subscribe. Thank you so much in advance. Back to the episode. Wow. Thank you so much for that deep down analysis. And I love those three questions. Why this? Why now? Um, and, you know, uh, why me, basically? It's, it's, it's really profound. We could, we could do a separate podcast on each of those. I do want to dive into why now a little bit because what I heard a lot in there, given my, um, given my engineering background, was you, you're breaking things down a lot into first principles, it seems, coming back to the why and breaking it back down to first principles and really understanding even the example you gave as to why do we even eat um, which you know I think most people just take for granted it's like where does food come from and it's interesting because why has this has this real digging capacity to the root cause of the problem as opposed to where does this how does this and that sort of leads into one of my other questions in and around that space is first principles and then it seems like you've built systems thinking but systems thinking on top of that instead of addressing how each of the systems then sort of work what you've gone ahead and done is thought about who is going to feed into each of the systems to your overall problem rather than getting bogged down in the how. Can you 
I've sort of summarized a few thoughts in my head. Can you expand upon just what I've just shared with you? First principle systems thinking and who, not how. Yeah, and that's, I think that's the fundamentally is a lot of the engineers when they start company, the reason they fail is not because they are terrible CEOs or that they are basically terrible at being uh, a, a, a audacious thinker. It is every time they look at the problem in their head, first thing they say, is, how am I going to do it? And the minute they focus on how they get stuck, I don't know how to do it. That way this problem cannot be solved, right? Rather than simply saying, what if? Someone can solve this problem. This is the problem I need to solve. And if it's not me, who else can solve this problem? And, and then let's focus on how we're going to do that. But that's much later. First, you need to understand what are the problems that need to be solved for your moonshot for it to be successful. And that's the first thing. And if you don't do that, you always get stuck in today's technology and how you would do it, you would do it rather than really focusing on the problems that need to be solving and then finding the best people to do that. And, and let me give you, and I think a lot of the times it is very counterintuitive. And I think our human brain, the way human brain works is it is designed to be local and linear. That means always extrapolates what happened in the past and it extrapolates into the future. And it can never ever understand the concept of the logarithmic scale or exponentiality. It can just does cannot fathom because just not it didn't evolve to ever have that thinking because the brain was supposed to be simply about survival and procreation. And the survival meant was here is a tiger and I need to run away from a tiger. We knew it was 100 feet away. I knew how fast you could run and you knew exactly you need to fight or you need to flight. Right. And that was very simple. It was very easy to understand linear thinking that way it would work. But exponent, the way it's working is our technology is growing in an exponential way and our brain thinks linearly. And that gap is why a lot of the people end up failing because they actually don't understand how this would work. OK, so now let me actually ground it and then I'll come back to the next concept of first principle since you mentioned that about how do you understand the root cause. But I want to ground this principle about why this, why now, why me into an example of how I used it specifically for, a, for the company that I started seven years ago. So seven years ago, my dad was diagnosed with a pancreatic cancer stage four. And I was like absolutely devastated that there's not much I can do. You know, there was nothing available that could have helped him understand that why he developed the cancer. And we could not detect it at his, you know, when it's stage zero or stage one, that something we could have done. At this point, it was pretty clear that he won't survive. I saw him suffer and die. And I made a promise to him that, Dad, I can't save you, but I'll make you a promise that I will work very hard to solve this problem of understanding why, why do we develop cancer? Why do we develop these chronic diseases, whether it is obesity, diabetes, heart disease, depression, anxiety, Alzheimer? What is it that changes in the human body that allows our body to be sick? So our first thing when I started seven years ago, my why this was very simple. Imagine living in a world where illness is truly optional. That means it is not based on bad luck, but it's simply based on the choices that we make every day. What if we can understand what changes in the human body at the onset and during the progression of these diseases? And if we can do that, could we actually find a way to prevent the diseases from happening stop the progression of it. And if we get outright lucky, can we actually reverse the diseases completely? And that was our why this. Imagine living in a world where illness is optional, right? Now, next part was why now? So first of all, in this thing, we asked ourselves, what if we are actually successful in solving the problem? Would it help a billion people live a better life? And the answer was, 8 billion people, every one of us during our lifetime is going to suffer from one of, the, uh, one of the diseases, even if it's nothing else, it's aging. And can we stop preventing the aging? So what is it that we could do? And if we succeed, would it help a billion people? And the answer was 8 billion, check mark. The next question we asked was, why now? 
and we actually broke it down. I said, to solve this problem, there are three subset of problems that have to be solved. Number one, you have to be able to digitize the human body because we have this analog body. Until we can digitize the human body, we won't be able to use all the tools that are available at our disposal to be able to manipulate the data. So once, first thing is we have to be able to digitize the human body. Number two, we have to be able to process massive amount of data that's gonna come out of digitization of our analog body. And number three, we have to be able, we have to have an AI that will be able to actually take this massive amount of data and make sense of it on for every disease, what might be the underlying biological changes that are happening for this to happen. And that's really simple. So only three problems that needed to be solved. We say, all right, let's look at now what is going on. We say to digitize the human body, we know how to do it. We have been now sequencing a people's genetic material, which are analog, and we are able to convert them into ACGT, which is digital. So we are able to take a specific sample, convert analog into digital. We know how to do that. Now, the first time when we started the company seven years ago, cost of that digitization was $1,000 to $1,200. We did not get discouraged because we realized that, had, that used to be millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, and it has come down to $1,000 to $1,200. We were absolutely convinced, given the path where they are, this cost should be coming down to about $100 in the next three to five years. We sit here seven years later, and the cost has come down to about $12 to $15, right? So even though when we thought we were 10 times optimistic, turns out we were still six or seven times pessimistic, right? And that is the power of exponential technologies. And I can explain that, that how human brain is so difficult. So if we were to you know, ask anyone and say, hey, if you were to take 30 steps, how far would you go from where you are? Almost every one of us can get very close within 10% of where we would be if we were to take 30 steps, right? But if you tell, ask someone, hey, how far would you go if you were to take 30 exponential steps? That means you take one step, then you take two steps, then you take four steps, then you take eight steps, and then you take 16 steps. And what would be after 30 doublings? How far would you go? And most people who cannot imagine that and they say, fine, I'll go to downtown, uh, you know, downtown somewhere that's a couple of miles away. Would they won't realize after 30 doublings, you would have gone 16 times around earth. Whoa. Right. And that is the power that we don't understand. Now, convert that into money is really easy. If I were to say, hey, Amrit, I'll give you $1 today. Right. Or... I'll, here better, I'll give you $100 million right now, no questions asked, or I will give you $1 today and I would double it for 30 more days. And what would you do? Most people in their head would say, you know, $1, it'll become two, it'll become four, it'll become eight, 16, 32, 64, $128. $256, $512, $1,000, $2,000. I'm thinking $100 I would take that right now because there's no way I've done now 10 doublings and I'm thinking it's only like you know $5,000, $4,000. It is not going to happen. Without realizing 30 doubling later, it is going to be $1 billion. Right? And that is the power because we do it you know, people say, oh, it's just nothing is happening. It's $1, $2, $4. This is not going to get to 100 million ever. And without realizing, once you hit the knee of the curve, boom, you are now growing exponentially and you will have $1 billion, 30 doubling later, right? And that's one of the problems that most people have very difficult time with. Right? So now going back on my things, uh, on examples, the second problem was processing. We realize we will never have access to supercomputers, but can we use cloud computing to actually process a massive amount of data? So we fired up on the AWS and we did the cost, $47 for processing a single data. And I'm thinking, oh my God, how am I gonna to get to a billion people if just processing alone takes 47? And we realize the cost of computing is coming down. Cost of storage is coming down. This thing used to be, you know, if you remember IBM, the five 
five megabyte drive used to require an airplane to carry it around. And now we have a terabyte on our phone. So we knew that this price actually would come down from $47 to $10. Guess what? It actually came down to about $1.25, right? So again, same thing. While we expect it to be 10 times smaller, we were actually still pessimistic about how fast this is coming down. And that is a part that we always have very difficult time with. Every one of us believe that AI is going to become more and more powerful and it is going to be there for us to be able to use it. And we say, great, that means now we can actually start a company that can solve this problem. Now, remember at this point, we didn't know how to solve this problem. We just knew here were the three things that needed to be solved. The last question was, why me? Why me was, we looked at that things again. Another interesting thing is I am not a scientist. I am not a doctor. I have no experience in this industry. And that is my biggest asset. Because once you become expert at something, you become an incremental thinker. That means you can make something 10% better than someone else, but you will never be able to make something. (laughs) You don't never change the paradigm shift. And the reason for that is because to become an expert, you have to take the foundational knowledge for granted because that's what makes you an expert. So you can never challenge the foundation because you are an expert. That's what makes you an expert. Whereas someone coming from outside is able to challenge the foundation of what you have taken it for granted. And that is what allows the disruption to happen, right? So coming back to the things, we looked at the world and we said, look, everyone in the industry is focused on one thing to know about to genetics. So there was 23andMe and Ancestry. Everyone thought if they knew my DNA, if they can somehow look at my DNA, they'll be able to figure out why we are getting sick. Now, basically not knowing anything, my first question was, does your DNA change when you gain 200 pounds? The answer is no. Does your DNA change when you become diabetic? The answer is no. Does your DNA change when you have a heart disease? No. Does DNA change when you have depression, anxiety? No. Does your DNA change when you die? In fact, you can look at a DNA 100 years after someone dies. It's the same DNA. That's how they find the DNA of dinosaurs, right? People go and exhume the body to find out if the right DNA matches with the crime, right? The point is DNA can't even tell you you're dead or alive, let alone are you healthier or sicker. And that was my first insight was, Wait a sec, this is a fool's paradigm. Nobody should be looking at DNA when you're specifically looking for chronic diseases. So my first question was, what changes if your DNA doesn't change? And the answer was, it is your RNA. Your genes don't change, but your gene expression is always changing. I don't know what that meant, but to me, that was the thing. That means you, now I try to understand what that really means. And it was, this is how I understood finally as a layman that every part of our body is identical DNA. Whether in a crime scene, you have your hair there or you have your skin there or you have your any any bodily tissue, it's the same DNA. That means my hair, my skin, my eyes, my lungs, my kidney, my heart, my neurons, my nails, they all have the same DNA. Yet, I don't have the nails growing on my head and the eyes growing on my fingers. Why is that? And the answer is because the different genes are expressed when they become I. Different genes are expressed when they become neuron. Identical DNA, but different expression can make every part of our body, right? And that is the key, understanding that a DNA is like an alphabet and RNA is the story that gets written. So if we could understand someone's RNA, we will know exactly what a story your body is writing. And that will be the key to understanding that why people are getting sick. Now, as I was thinking that, oh my God, this is awesome. We realized that nine, you know, I was now, once I start to get down to something, I'm mean, this is another, you know, things I do. I read a lot. I probably must have read thousand research papers on obesity, on diabetes, on the heart disease, and depression, and anxiety. And it started to look like, for whatever reasons, 
whether it's Parkinson's or Alzheimer or depression, everything people were talking about that your microbiome is connected to the diseases. So today, if anyone to Google obesity and microbiome, diabetes and microbiome, heart disease and microbiome, depression and microbiome, addiction and microbiome, cancer and microbiome, cancer therapy and microbiome, it turns out everything was connected to microbiome. And my thinking was, oh my God, that's amazing. And yet it bothered me because if everyone believes the microbiome is the root cause of all these diseases and there are 10 companies doing microbiome testing, then why is this problem not being solved? That we go back to our first principle, what questions are they asking? And it turns out every single microbiome company was asking the same wrong question, which is, I want to know about what organisms are in someone's gut, what organisms are in someone's mouth, but they were looking for what organisms are there. And again, just like a DNA, the point was, does your organism change when you have diabetes? Does your organism change when you have heart disease? And the answer is, it's not the organism that change, but what they are producing is constantly changing. Based on what food we eat, it changes what they express. Based on the environment we live in, based on the stress we have, our organisms are producing completely different things. And when they're producing different things, it causes different diseases. So if you are stressed, you're not sleeping well, you're not exercising, and you're eating uh, McDonald's, it is producing very different thing than when you're eating healthy, sleeping well, have no stress, right? And that is the thing was, so we said, look, what if we focus on what they are expressing, what they are producing, and how it is interacting with the human body. And if we can do that, then we can solve this problem. And that's literally was the foundational of why we said, this is the question we should be asking is, what is the human gene genes are expressing? What are the microbiome producing? And if we can look at the interaction between what they are producing and what we are, how our genes expression are changing, we can solve this problem. And that became why. Now, we still have no idea how to do it. Remember, in this framework, we never focused on how we are going to do that. We simply focused, now we knew what problem needed to be solved. And the only thing left to solve this problem was how to do it, right? But everything else we knew what to do now, right? And that is how applying that why this, why now, why me. Now, to basically, to finish the story, I now simply had one simple thing, find a way to understand the RNA, how to do the RNA sequencing, find a way to understand using RNA sequencing what microbes are going to be producing. So I now went to every NASA center. So I went to NASA JPL. You sending these rovers to Mars, don't you know how, what these, or if you were to find some organism, don't you know how to figure out what they are doing? And the answer was, no, we don't really care. We just want to find out if there is a life there. We don't really care what they're doing. And I thought, God, bunch of morons. If you go to NASA headquarters, they probably have figured this thing out. So I went to NASA Houston and, you know, got to play with the moon rocks, all that good stuff. No solution. Went to Kennedy Space Center, nothing there. Went to Stanford, went to MIT, went to Los, you know, went to <clears throat> Lawrence Berkeley, Lawrence Livermore. And I'm now at Los Alamos National Lab. And as you can realize, Los Alamos National Lab is famous for building an atomic bomb. It was called Manhattan Project, but it was done at Los Alamos. They were working on an unbelievable technology to protect our country from bioweapons, so biodefense project. And to solve that problem, they needed to develop this technology that they spent 10 years doing, which was, God forbid, if there was a bioterrorism in our great country, how would we know what just happened? They couldn't care less about what organisms were there in bioweapon. They needed to know what they are producing so they can create antidote for it. And to do that, they had to create this technology and they ended up developing the RNA sequencing technology to find out what microbes are producing. And we ended up getting a license to the technology ended up hiring the person who developed the technology, Dr. Vucic, who became my chief science officer. Hired the head of IBM Watson Research to come and join to do the AI. Remember, these were the best people. They were joining, why? Going back to what I started with. 
because we could make illness optional helping 8 billion people live a better life. So they were willing to come and join. These people didn't need a job. These people had an unbelievably great job. So Dr. Bonwar, who was head of IBM Watson Research, was in the top 100 people at IBM, making millions of dollars. I'm offering him 100K salary. And he says, I will join you because this is the problem I want to work on. This, if we can solve this problem, we will have an unbelievably great company. Here's an employee of a federal government who says, I have a retirement plan and I'm going to join a startup and give up everything because this is the problem I want to solve. Right? And now, as soon as we build this team together, suddenly every venture capitalist saying, what are you doing that these people are joining you? They want to fund the company. And that's literally was the how we started wine. So what I, the reason I mentioned that is to simply tell you that everything that I tell you as a funda founding principles actually do get applied in real life and in real life, how they actually work and succeed. Hi there, guys. I wanted to take a quick moment just to introduce you to my one-to-one -one coaching. It's something that I deeply love doing. As you can tell, conscious conversation is such a massive part of my life. And having one-to-one -one deep, meaningful conversations with people where I get to show up as your brother or as the coach or as your mentor has been such a gift for me personally and a gift for lots of the people that I have supported on the journey of living a more spiritually empowered, spiritually powered, spiritually aligned life. You don't have to take my word for it. Here's some examples of people all around the world that have experienced profound transformations through this coaching experience. Amrit is a fantastic coach. In a few sessions, he got to a depth that I'd only experienced before working with certain medicines. And He's gone through a lot of the struggles that you're probably facing. And Amrit's been a really strong, supportive figure in my journey. In control of myself. I'm kinder to myself. I actually have that vision and a purpose. I do feel like I'm a better version of myself already. Amazing energy. He was easy to talk to, which made me easy to trust him. Working with Emmerich at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning, and really I was bouncing out of bed. Whenever I get off the calls with Emmerich, best money we've ever spent. <laughs> I would not recommend him because I don't want everyone to know about him, and then I won't be able to book him. If he gets too busy, I won't get my turn. I would say absolutely. There's no way you can work with Amrit for a period of time without being transformed. So if you're considering him as a coach, do not hesitate because you won't be disappointed. Alrighty, so hopefully that's inspiring your evolution onwards and upwards. And if you are so inspired to evolve, you can book in a one-to-one -one call with me directly at www.amrit.coach forward slash life. And guys, if I can say so myself, I do think this is something quite special. Most people that I see building things online don't really work with people this deeply, this intimately, one on one as things start to grow, just because it is so time intensive. And yet I'm so deeply passionate about the transformation that comes from one to one coaching that just isn't available anywhere else. It would be my absolute honor and a pleasure to support your spiritual awakening, your spiritual path, your spiritual unfoldment. It is my life's work. I look forward to seeing you in the call. Back to today's podcast. It's incredible to hear the journey of Viome and how it comes and gets put together. Thank you so much for drilling into the, the, the what. Now, I want to dive in a little bit to the who because I consciously flicking all the way back into your own journey with your father and everything that happened. It does, and this is the nature of the podcast a little bit, but it does lead into a bit of a spiritual philosophical question for me because we all learn particularly profound lessons throughout our life, whether that's your soul that's here to learn that lesson. Um, but your father's passing, um, may he rest in peace, was quite um, quite the moment in time for yourself. And from there came the solution that is Viome in many ways. So, But most people, when they dig into their why, are probably going to excavate some level of either profound joy or profound pain that is motivating them towards whatever there is here to really do. So do you think, when you think about legacy, spirituality, do you think there is, everyone's here to sort of provide a particular, a particular thing? Um, do you get the nature of my question? I do. I do. And, I mean, I can answer that both from the Eastern philosophy of spiritually, and we can also look at from a scientific perspective of, you know, scientifically, you know, you could argue two ways. 
that every, you know, we as humans are simply made of atoms, right? Atoms are made of electrons and protons, and they're made of quarks, which are made of bosons. And bosons are basically nothing but the fundamental founding energy, which are electromagnetic waves. So we are essentially a floating electromagnetic waves, and all of us, everything around us is a simply electron, you know, electromagnetic wave. Yet our brain actually processes these electromagnetic wave and makes sense of the world. And we see people, we see trees, we see moon, we see stars, we see, you know, everything we see is actually created in our mind. It is created by human mind to be able to make sense of the world. But really, it is simply a floating energy. When we die, the energy becomes part of the universal energy. And when we are born, in some sense, manifestation of that energy is reuse that energy. And in religion, we call that reincarnation, right? But it is really is about reusing of energy never dies. It simply changes and it comes right back, right? So in that way, what we see is simply not real, but a manifestation of reality that we see. In fact, people always wonder, how can it not be real? And I'm saying it's a very species specific thing. What you see, a snake doesn't see. What we hear, bats hear a different thing than we hear. Dogs smell the different thing than we smell. So what is a reality? Reality for who, right? And our senses are also very limited. So if I were to tell you that, hey, I hear Taylor Swift playing here. And you would say, what a cuckoo, because there is nothing here. There is nothing playing. And as soon as you put a receiver called radio, you can hear. That means sound is already here. We just can't hear it. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist here, because it exists maybe in a short wave. Maybe it exists in the XM wave. Maybe it exists in the medium wave. But all of the sound frequency are already here, or else radio won't be able to tune into it and play it for you, by definition, right? So my point I'm going to make is that, so from that perspective, you know, it is hard to understand we, do we have a purpose or do we just simply exist in the manifestation of as we do, right? So that's one part. But spiritually, I do believe that we humans come here and in the idea is that, you know, that we have a purpose in life. We are here to redeem our soul. And once we have completed our karma, soul goes to rest in peace, right? Right. Now, the other way to also look at this stuff is that, is there a God? And science and religion are starting to some extent, starting to say the same things in different words. We say there is a God and our, in, at least in Hindu philosophy, your destiny is pre-written. And the science says there is a programmer and we are living in a simulation and we are simply an algorithm. What does it really mean? Programmer is God. Our destiny is an algorithm which is pre-written. And what they are saying is, you know, spirituality also says we are all one. Remember, we are all one. What does it mean? We are all part of the same energy, right? When we start to separate away from universe to us is really where the problem is. We are all as a part of one simple universe that all belong into one. And that means that's what I was talking about. We are simply a floating energy. We are all part of that one big floating energy. So it's start to see how religion, spirituality, and science are say the same thing, but in slightly different words. But the concept is very similar. The last part that really fascinates me, which is totally tangent, is that if the you know world out there doesn't really exist and our mind is making up because the quantum theory says that all these electrons and every single thing, particle, is simply can be in all possibilities. That means every possibility exists until we observe it and then it, the, the waves collapse and what we see becomes real, right? So are we creating the reality or does the reality exist without the human species watching it? <laughs> that is one of my deepest fascinations. And I like, I, I, I love venturing down that path because some part of me, like obviously theories of relativity is, you know, Einstein 
uncovered that and it was like maybe everything was always relative but then also like you alluded to it was like was it all relative before or did it just become relative after <laughs> and it's like okay okay stop or, stop, or, stop, or stop. What? Yeah. he said nothing can travel faster than the speed of light yet we see the quantum entanglement which are miles away and the instantaneous so that means somewhere along the life the information is traveling faster than light yeah it's completely fascinating. And I love um, your interpretation of just, yeah, just again, bringing it back to what really is the nature of reality. And then it comes back to, and from that science principle, then you end up in this place of like, oh, maybe it's Maya, maybe it's all an illusion, you know, and you end up in this place where things are becoming more and more reconciled between science and spirituality, because you, you're at the, you're at the frontier of the limitations of what human consciousness can really expand upon. Um, and it's okay to have those limitations, right? Because that is what ultimately makes us human. But I love where this conversation is at because it's all about thinking outside of the box, pushing yourself further. One of the things that I found, uh, on one of your documentaries I was watching was in terms of pushing yourself further, you said something that really stood out to me, which was amongst many things I should <laughs> say. Um, one of the things that really stood out to me was hum humility is actually the fundamental way marker of success. Um, can you expand upon that? Because that doesn't seem like an obvious, an obvious takeaway. Yeah. So first of all, you know, we should never define success by how much money someone has in the bank. To me, the success of definition, the definition of success is really about how many lives you're able to improve while you're still alive. Right. And the humility, the day you become humble is the day you become successful. And the reason for that is if you still have a tiny bit of arrogance left in you, that means you're still trying to prove something to yourself or someone else. The day you start proving is the day you have become successful is because you no longer have to really prove. And that's where the humility comes in, because humility means I don't have to tell you that I am the smartest guy. I don't have to prove it to you that I am the richest guy. I don't have to tell you anything about who I am. And that is really where the success comes from. The success is about becoming that reaching that goal of humility where you no longer are trying to do things to prove something. I find that incredibly valuable because I think where so many of us are pushing from a place of lack and a place of not really feeling whole. And I think the the connotations that you wrote the book around moonshot and stepping into abundance is beyond just financial abundance. Um, it's really abundance on in every dimension and, uh, and every plane there. I was thinking about as a parent also, we have to incorporate the same thing into our children. So to me, that our success is also defined by what is, what, how do we raise our children so that we are not simply leaving the better world for our children, but also leaving better children for the world, right? How are we going to give them the same type of hunger and intellectual curiosity? So they are going out there and pursuing their big dreams. And one of the biggest flaw that I see is Many entrepreneurs who become successful, they end up, actually their children end up becoming bums. And is be why is that? It's because in many of the times the parents have not given them the hunger and the intellectual curiosity. And so children don't do what they, you tell them to do. They do what they see you do, right? So when you are successful, and you see, I made so much money. And then you tell your children, money doesn't matter. You should go out and do great things. And then you say, I want to spend time with my children because I made so much money. What really happens is that's the most selfish thing to do at the cost of destruction of lives of your children. And here's why. Because when they go to school, they see their dad sitting on the sofa watching CNBC. They come back from school. And they see dad is sitting on the sofa watching CNBC, tells the kids, go work hard, go to your room, finish your homework. Hard work is what it takes. And all they see is, I want to grow up just like my dad, sit on the sofa and watch CNBC. Right? Now, my first company was widely successful and our children were under 10 years old. I should have said, you know, I, I want to spend time with my children. I'm going to sit home. Instead, I started the second company and the third company. And then I say, I'm, we're going to build a company to go to the moon. Kids, 
It's never been done dead. How can you do that? You show them what you can take on an audacious idea and do it. I'm turning 60. Dad says, I'm going to solve the healthcare. Dad, you know nothing about healthcare. How are you going to do it? Well, let me show you how you can do that, right? Now, every one of our children, so I have three kids now, 30, 30, 34 years old, Angkor. Now, he is already running a unicorn. He went to Wharton, and now he's building a first company. He's actually in the Forbes cover as self-made billionaire. Now, I didn't have to do anything. What? And I'll tell you, what is it that we did there, right? Our daughter went to Stanford, Stanford Mayfield Fellow, Stanford Stamp Fellow, first company using AI to use, remove gender bias. And she started a company called EV, EVVY, a women's health company to solve underlying women's health issues. Because she realized that until 30 years ago, women weren't even allowed to be in clinical research. That means all the drugs women take are never tested on women, don't work on women. So she wanted to solve how to help these 4 billion of human species that have completely been ignored, how to help women live a healthier, better life. Right? Our youngest one also went to Stanford, became a Schwarzman scholar, and also now being part of Unicorn. Right? So point number one is three kids, all. Why is that? Because we focused on giving them intellectual curiosity. Our goal was not to take them to the water and make them drink. Our job, to make, our job was to make them thirsty. And the way you create thirst is to give them the curiosity. Then they will find their own water and they will drink. And the way you create curiosity is teaching them that everything they see can be challenged. So for example, if I were to, if a child were to say, oh, look at that a beanie hat, what an amazingly great gray color beanie hat. You don't say, yep, that is so. You simply say, you know, the color doesn't really exist. What you're seeing is simply a photons hitting your retina and your brain actually making up a color. So what you're seeing actually is not real. And reason for that is to, for them to start thinking that everything, that even the things they see with their eyes can actually be challenged that allows them to challenge foundation of everything they see or do. I love that. Going back to challenging the foundations is uh, your mum used to say to you that uh, actually the sky is the limit. And then at some point you realized what sky I'll let you tell the story. <laughs> yeah, basically I think I mean, the sky doesn't really exist. The sky is simply a figment of our imagination we create these barriers called sky that don't exist and we call them that we cannot go past the sky. That is the limit. And we see, I'm a brown guy, I can't do that, that's my sky. I'm a woman, I can't do that, that's my sky. Until we get there and realize it was simply in our mind, there was no barrier. We create the barriers in our own mind. And uh, yeah, I... I found you saying that basically it's not about leaving a better world for our children, but also about leaving better children for the world. And I've got a three-year-old and a six-month-old. Man, that quote really, really means a lot to me. Thank you, brother. And yeah. only other thing I would tell you, Amrit, is that since you have young kids, is that instead of reading them the stories, what I used to do when our children were young, I would have them create stories. So I would say, tell me a story about a monkey and an ocean and a, um, and a tree. Now they have to connect the dots of creating a story. And they will say, dad, now you tell me a story about these things, right? And the idea was, how do you connect the dots that look completely disconnected? And their mind starts to think that everything in the world can actually be connected when you think in an abstract terms. I love that. I can see myself and my son having so much fun with that alone. Thank you so much, Naveen. And that actually bleeds into one of the things I wanted to touch on today is self-worth because so much of our self-worth is actually hijacked in society based on capitalism and consumerism as a mechanism within capitalism. Um, but you've, you've challenged that for your, for yourself, for your children. It, it, it does self-worth doesn't come from what you own. It comes from what you create that's epic. Tell me more about that. I mean, again, think about it. If you inherit a lot of money, your self-worth is, st you're still a parasite on humanity. 
until you create something that gives back to the society. That means your self-worth and your self-worth can never come from what you own. It comes from what you actually create something that creates value. That means I'm not suggesting you become a philanthropist and give to the humanity. I'm saying create something that benefits the humanity so you can create an amazingly great enterprise. Every one of our kids goes out and says, this is the problem we are going to solve. And by solving the problem, they create a unicorn. But they don't say, Dad, I want to create a unicorn. What should I do? Right? That is never the thing. It always comes down to is, I'm going to solve this problem because this is a problem I care about. I love that. One of the big things I'm taking away from today's conversation is that it's important to be a visionary because it helps people align to the, the bigger the vision, the easier it is to rally resources around it, um, encouraging even our children to build into the concept of vision. And I love the disparate points conversation, how important it is to create and bring people behind a vision. One of the things that I haven't really heard you talk too much about is the importance of actually being a futurist. And I kind of feel like this is, has emerged in today's conversation between us is because as you said earlier, technology is growing at an exponential rate. Even the world our children will inherit is going to be such a drastically different world. Um, and so the importance of being a futurist in some regards, do we like given the rate of exponential growth of everything around us at the moment, do you think that's a necessary fundamental skill for most people that are looking to step onto the entrepreneurial path? I mean, futurist doesn't mean you having a crystal ball. So I just don't want people to think that somehow uh, you have a crystal ball where you can see what the world is going to be in 10, 15 years from now. You basically apply the first principles to say, hey, if we are going to have nanotechnologies that are today here in three, five years, what are things you starting to see in the lab? So one of the things I do is I don't have a crystal ball. But what I realized is if there are 100 papers coming out on something in research lab today, it is a matter of three to five years, they're going to become the mainstream. Because when there's so much momentum and the research on a particular field, it is bound to become a mainstream in three to five years. So when I started to see there were hundreds and thousands of research papers coming out on how gut microbiome impacts the disease, we knew it is going to become mainstream. So today when Lady Gaga talks about microbiome, it's not I was a futurist. It was pretty simple to me of what was going to happen because we saw of how these things come from research labs to here. So when you say futurist, all we do is starting to see what is happening, what are the things that are going to continue happening in the next three to five years, and if they were to happen, what would you do with that? So if you say if nanotechnology is going to be in the next five to 10 years, it's small enough where we'll be able to modify the each atom, could they actually be inside the body monitoring our human body to know exactly where the problem is, deliver the oxygen, and to be able to repair the organs where it needs to be repaired, take the stem cell and actually deliver it to the organ so that you actually never ever be sick because your organs are constantly being repaired. Even if your heart stops working, your nanobots will be able to call, tell you that your heart stopped working. Don't you worry, I got plenty of oxygen here. I'm going to continue delivering the oxygen to the body. Call your doctor, let him know to print a new heart for you and you'll be there in two hours. Right. And that's literally could happen. That's not a futurist. It is something you can see why that would happen because you are able to develop in organs using standard tissues today. And you know, in three to five years, you'll be able to print your 3D print your organs. So it's not that somehow it's a futurist thing to do. You start to see the technology already moving in that direction. Wow. Is AI uh, similar, I've heard some people on the podcast, it, there seems to be a bit of a division in society at the moment. Some people are like doom and gloom around AI. Some people are like, it is the future and it is like the advent of fire. It's as big as a step change as the, like in, like as when the internet first sort of started emerging as a collective tool for the entire species, race, whatever you want to call it, um, humanity at large. Your perspective on AI and the future of the role, you, you're, you're leaning in super hard, right? So interesting thing is people have this idea of AI, whether it's a three years or five years, is going to become so smart that it will have no use for humans and what would be the purpose of humanity. 
what people don't realize is, you know, these things happen incrementally and we humans actually end up adopting these technologies ourselves and we are constantly getting better and better. So when these things become really smart, the gap is not today's human versus that, it is a day before that and that. And that's very small incremental change. And you know, AI, the beauty of AI is, as soon as it becomes part of our life, we no longer think of AI, think of this as AI, right? So. People think robotics and AI, I don't use them at home. And you have dishwasher. What is a dishwasher? It's the robotics and AI at home. What's the, you know, your washer, you know, clothing washer is actually a robotics AI uh, right there. You don't think of them as that. Now, you don't think of a Google map as, oh my God, I am now using AI and it's going to kill me. What happens is we become so used to it, right? Because we think we know our neighborhood. So you take a Google map and it says, make a left turn. You say, ah, what a dumb thing. I know my house. I'm going to take a right turn. I know exactly a shortcut and you f run into a traffic. And suddenly you realize, oh my God, Google knew why it was asking me to take a left turn because it knew there was a traffic jam here, right? And suddenly next time when Google says, make a right turn, you say, follow the God, I'm making a right turn, right? Point is now you have given up your idea of your executive function and decision making to Google. Next time when you go to a restaurant, it says recommend this place to go to, and you go there, you enjoy. Now you suddenly say, oh, every time I see a recommendation, I'm taking it because it knows what I enjoy. Right? And as many of these things are happening, including generative AI, we are going to start incorporating them into our flow, our work, our things, and AI plus human is getting smarter and smarter and by the time we get AGI, we are almost there with the AI plus humans already. So it's not going to be that much of a big gap between what happens. And this big, if there was a, you know, extraterrestrial, somebody came with a super intelligence and landed on earth and we were still what who we are, I can see why there would be a big gap. But since we are developing these tools incrementally and all those things we are starting to incorporate ourselves, I really don't believe that AI is going to be danger. In fact, AI is going to become a human tool, just like we use laptops. That's why I use everything else. It's simply going to become part of our life. Yeah, and I think there's a, personally, I feel like there's a real space for it, even given the, the depopulation conversation that's happening around the globe in leading Western countries. What robotics and technology is really going to need to step in to be able to support the the productivity, I guess, that's required to continue to bolster and support the aging population around the world. You touched on AGI, which is a really interesting conversation because I think many people don't really understand at the moment when we come back to first principles in this doom and gloom narrative that some people carry around AI is that actually current AI is only interpolating data from all like a vast amount of data, which is, don't get me wrong, highly impressive that it's doing that, but it's not actually extrapolating at the moment. Can you just uh, define that for some people just so that they can feel a little bit more comfortable because I feel like a lot of people are uncomfortable with what AI currently is, but it's not creative. It's just interpolating based on the vast amount of data that's available for them. It is to large extent is somewhat creative in a sense. There is the emerging properties that come out of the knowledge. I mean, just like humans, right? So how does human become creative? Your parents are feeding you knowledge. So that means human knowledge is being transferred to a child and child creates this emerging property that comes out of that knowledge. And AI will do the same thing, but those are emerging properties based on our current knowledge. And as our current knowledge is constantly changing, our emerging properties are going to be constantly changing, right? So to me, the definition of AGI is constantly changing. It used to be uh, AGI would be when it's able to do a work, you know, first thing was Turing. Can we pass a Turing test? which is uh, would humans be able to distinguish between having a conversation with AI versus another human? We passed that test now. Already. Can, hum yeah. can it, we did, right? Now, can it do things like AP classes of math or biology or LSAT or you know, GMAT? It's already done that, right? So point is, it's able to do many of the things that we expect that used to be called AGI. So our definition of AGI is constantly changing because uh, our understanding of what is AGI is evolving because 
we believe everything that's happening is not AGI. So there must be something else that makes us human. That is something else that is just so core to who we are as humans. And AI doesn't do that. But, and a first reaction is, well, it doesn't have emotions. It doesn't have empathy. And even if AI did have that, we're going to say, well, it's kind of faking it, right? It doesn't really have empathy. <laughs> when humans do that, we don't say, oh, I think you're faking empathy. You really don't have it. Right? Point is, you won't know the difference when she tells you that AI tells you that I love you. You won't know the difference that no different than some girl, you know, you're dating and she say, I love you. How do you know she loves you or she's faking it or she really means it, right? So how would you suddenly think that AI is is real or not real just because it told you it loves you? Does it love you or does it not love you? Yeah, it's uh, what I'm taking away is really back to our conversation earlier is the fundamental nature of curiosity. That is a value that AI will share with us, but humans' curiosity will be incredibly valuable um, going forward as well. And as it always has been, I guess, uh, is what you would probably argue. But then also... I think overarchingly today's conversation has also sat under this umbrella of imagine. Um, and that's just something that is unique as a human property. I just want to wrap up by allowing you to sort of share your thoughts on, I think even your, the invitation you had for me to allow the kids to talk to a few data points and imagine a story between them speaks volumes in terms of how important you think imagination is. But yeah, if we can wrap up today with discussing imagination. Yes, to me, the imagination is the only thing that limits to what we can achieve. If we can imagine it, we can achieve it. And the only reason people can't achieve something is they can't imagine it in a vivid details. And that's what I call distorted reality is that when you see it so clearly what the world needs to be and you can see it so clearly, you can describe it. Everyone else who can't see it thinks you have a distorted reality. In fact, your reality is real that you're going to create. So until someone creates that world, it looks like a world that's not real until someone creates it. So to me, if you ever want to achieve something in real life and if you want to predict the future, go ahead and create it. Naveen Jain. <laughs> wow, brother. Thank you so much for today's conversation. I'll put a link to Moonshots for those that want to dive in deeper on how to really blow your thinking out of the water and just imagine and dream bigger. I cannot recommend a better resource that's in the show notes below. And we talked a lot about Viome and microbiome wellness. And I think for a lot of people tuning into this channel, wellness is a big part of our trajectory and just making sure we have really sound fundamental health. Um, I know a lot of people tuning in are leaning towards that mental health, but there's a very big link between gut health and mental health, which is a common conversation we have here. So please do check out Viome. I'll put a link to that in the show notes below as well. Naveen, brother, I could totally thank you for your time and energy thank you. today. And I'm conscious it's been an hour's worth of conversation. And yet it's so obvious that it stands on the shoulders of the giant that is your life's work. Um, brother, thank you so much, not just for today. Thank you, brother. I really appreciate you. Are, you. Thank you. So I want to, first of all, thank you for doing what you do. And everyone who's listening to it, I want to, you to know that. Please drop in a note for Amrit and let, let, and let him know how much we appreciate what he does. Because without you, there's so many people who won't have access to all the knowledge that you bring in from so many different people. I personally appreciate you. I appreciate all the hard work you do. Even though you make it look so easy, I know the amount of work that goes into it, you doing the research on everything and asking the right questions. So thank you so much for doing what you do and I appreciate you. Thank you so much, brother. Alrighty, Inspired Soul, you've made it through to the end of another Inspired Evolution podcast. Thank you so much for your inspiration to evolve. I'm so inspired by your persistence, your diligence, your dedication to your inner work to evolve. On screen right now is an opportunity for you to continue your inspirations and to keep the evolution flowing. There are a couple of episodes on screen which are two personal favorites of mine. As always, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel. It helps so much more than we can say. This entire channel is powered by your subscription. And yeah, I'll see you in the next one.